Hey everyone, welcome back to Nurse Crit. My name is Jason. I'm an acute care nurse practitioner. Most nurses know that the heart is only perfused during diastole, but do you know the reason why? What if I told you that's actually only partially true? It was so fascinating to me when I learned the physiologic explanation of coronary perfusion pressures, so I thought I would share it with you all. If you have any interest in the heart, stick around till the end to learn something they probably didn't teach you in nursing school. The objectives of this video are to understand coronary perfusion pressures, understand the left versus right heart perfusion, and understand pathologic states that can affect coronary perfusion. To understand coronary perfusion pressures, you first have to understand pressure gradients. A pressure gradient is the difference between the propelling force minus the resistance. This should make intuitive sense. You can't move something forward if the opposing force is stronger. The gradient has to be net positive to move something forward. The same physics principles apply to the blood flow in the heart. Remember that the heart pumps out blood into the aorta, which is the main conduit for blood to be transported to the entire body. The coronary arteries branch off from the aorta right at the base where the aorta attaches to the heart. These coronary arteries are what feeds blood into the heart muscle. So if blood is pumping out of the heart into the aorta, including the coronary arteries during systole, why do we say that the heart is only perfused during diastole? Well, this goes back to understanding pressure gradients. First, let's look at the intracardiac, pulmonary, and aortic pressures. These are considered the normal pressures within each compartment. These numbers may vary slightly between sources. Working our way through the heart from beginning to end, the right atrium has pressures of 2 to 6 millimeters of mercury. Moving into the right ventricle, we have a RV systolic pressure of 15 to 30, and RV diastolic pressure of 0 to 8. From the RV, blood is then pumped into the pulmonary artery. The normal PA systolic pressure is 15 to 30, and the diastolic is 5 to 15. As blood passes from the pulmonary artery through the capillaries and pulmonary veins, it drains into the left atrium with a normal LA pressure of 5 to 15. Notice that both atria are low pressure chambers that only have a single value pressure. There is not a systolic and diastolic pressure like the rest of the heart. Onward to the left ventricle, the LV systolic pressure is normally around 90 to 130, while the LV diastolic pressure is only about 4 to 12. Finally, blood is ejected into the aorta, which generates the systolic and diastolic pressures that all nurses are taught and most familiar with. Normal aortic or systemic blood pressure is 90 to 130 over 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury. Now that we know the normal pressures throughout the heart and aorta, we can now look at some simple math to understand why cardiac perfusion only occurs during diastole. In the heart, it's the aortic pressure that competes against the intraventricular pressure to drive blood flow forward through the coronary arteries. Let's use an example of a patient with a normal blood pressure of 130 over 80. In a patient with normal anatomy and physiology, you can see that the aortic systolic pressure is generally equal to the left ventricular systolic pressure. So if you have a systolic pressure of 130, and the systolic pressure in the LV is 130, they cancel each other out. The pressure of the blood moving forward is equal to the resistance. So you can see mathematically that blood does not move into the left coronary artery during systole. Now let's look at a cycle of diastole. A normal diastolic pressure of 80 minus a normal LV diastolic pressure of 12 gives us a net positive 68. During diastole, the higher aortic pressure overcomes the lower LV pressure, and the ventricle gets perfused. A normal left ventricular coronary perfusion pressure is around 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury. Now let's take a look to see what happens in the right ventricle. Using the same systemic blood pressure of 130 over 80, we take 130 minus a normal RV systolic pressure of 30, and that gives us a net positive 100. For diastole, we take 80 minus the normal RV diastolic pressure of 8, and we get 72. 
For the right ventricle, based on these numbers, we can see that perfusion occurs during both systole and diastole, with greater perfusion during systole. So the maxim that the heart is only perfused during diastole is not true for the right ventricle. This is how the heart works in states of normal physiology. But what about in cases of pathophysiology? Let's take aortic valve stenosis as an example. The aortic valve sits between the left ventricle and the aorta. In aortic stenosis, the valve does not open properly and blood has a harder time moving from the LV into the aorta. This tends to increase pressure within the LV and decrease pressure in the aorta. How does this affect perfusion? Because of severe aortic stenosis, let's say our patient's systemic blood pressure is 100 over 60 and the LV pressure is elevated at 150 over 25. 100 minus 150 is a net negative 50, and 60 minus 25 is net positive 35. So during systole, there is actually retrograde blood flow backwards through the coronary artery and only a small amount of pressure moving blood forward during diastole. Remember that a normal coronary perfusion pressure is around 60 to 80. 35 is well below that normal range. So in patients with severe aortic stenosis, there can be significant ischemia to the left ventricle, even with clear, unobstructed coronary arteries. To make matters worse, if the aortic stenosis is long-standing, the LV will start to hypertrophy to try to overcome the increased resistance. A bigger heart muscle requires more blood flow, which can't happen due to the dysregulated pressure gradients, and you have a vicious cycle leading to heart failure. The same thing can happen to the right ventricle when there is increased resistance. Rather than a stenotic valve, pulmonary hypertension is a common cause of RV failure. When pulmonary pressures are elevated, it transmits that pressure back into the RV, raising the intraventricular pressure. To make this easier to understand, let's look at some numbers again. Someone with severe pulmonary hypertension now has an RV pressure of 60 over 20. Assuming the person has a normal systemic blood pressure of 130 over 80, we take 130 minus 60, which gives us 70, and 80 minus 20, which is 60. Earlier, we had an RV perfusion pressure of 100 over 70. Now we have a pressure of 70 over 60, which is quite a bit lower, but not horrible. But in states where the patient has systemic hypotension plus pulmonary hypertension, this can drastically reduce the perfusion to the right ventricle. Imagine the perfusion pressure now down to 40 over 40. Now it's getting perfused equally during systole and diastole, which is definitely not what it is used to. This will lead to severe RV failure and multi-organ dysfunction and eventually death. And that is coronary perfusion pressures. The next time you hear someone exclaim that the heart is only perfused during diastole, you can snap back at them and say, not for the right ventricle. If you found this video helpful, please like it and share it with your nursing friends, especially your CVICU friends who deal with cardiac pressures every day. If you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to my channel so you don't miss out on future videos. Thanks for watching and I hope you will join me in my next video.